It's uh, my privilege uh, to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Weissman, uh, who is a senior project scientist for the Humble uh, Space Telescope. Uh, Jennifer is going to talk about her own journey uh, from a little Osak farm in Arkansas, in the central part of the U.S., a place that allowed her to dream big and uh, to explore the world around her. And one day, in 1987, uh, end up discovering a new comet uh, known as 114P, the Weissman Skiff, as, as you can tell, which bears her name. Or she was still an, an undergraduate student at the MIT. It's a big deal. So let's give her a loud of applause. You know, big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And later, she, she found a path uh, to NASA in 2003 when she became a project scientist uh, for the Humble Space Telescope, well known, of course, the most famous telescope in the world, uh, considered to have yielded the most important astronomical observation since Galileo uh, began using a telescope in the early 1600s. So you can actually imagine the way uh, she is calling. Of course, carrying forward the legacy of the Galileos and so forth. It is still operating today, 29 years since it was launched, since uh, 1990, and continues to gather a breathtaking photograph of our universe, thanks to her leadership. Uh, we are going to bear to hear what uh, excites her about uh, that journey, uh, sharing the excitement and the challenges of uh, scientific discovery across a broad cultural landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speaker, Jennifer Weissman. Wow, well, I've never had an introduction quite like that before. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So uh, it's fun to be up here and, and give a talk like this. This is a little different from the talks I usually give. So um, we can be a little more informal here. I'd love to hear from... Uh, some of you at your various stages of your career and, and the things that uh, you're experiencing and, and curious about and I'll tell you a little bit about my path which is still in progress as is all of our paths. Uh, perhaps maniac is the right version for this talk at least for me that's how I feel sometimes but um, I just want to show you kind of the bigger picture that I've seen in my career path uh, and of course the universe itself gives us a big a bigger picture of life um, I particularly like this image this is the uh, image we released from the Hubble Space Telescope mission at its 25th anniversary a few years ago so this is uh, the Westerland 2 star cluster recently formed out of an interstellar cloud and because we have such an awesome telescope in space we can see the cluster of stars uh, most of them are much bigger than our sun and we can also see the various aspects of the interstellar cloud that are still in existence they haven't it hasn't quite been blown away and in fact lower mass stars are still forming in this cloud and you can see many different colors of the cloud and in fact the camera that has imaged this, the Wide Field Camera 3, was developed right here at Goddard Space Flight Center, and we're very proud of it. And it's a panchromatic camera. It can see ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. And all of that information is incorporated into this image, along with some great image processing tools, so you can actually see light that you wouldn't normally see with your eyes. And you can see just how beautiful and active a region like this is. If you look carefully, you can see these little pillars coming up um, in the cloud, here, 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 and they're always pointing back toward bright stars, and that's because these bright stars that have recently formed have winds and outflows that are going back into the interstellar cloud. They're blowing away the less dense material. The denser stuff is left behind a little bit longer with its wakes behind it, which makes for these pillars always pointing back to massive stars that have recently formed. Lower mass stars are embedded in this cloud and they're still forming. So star formation is active. It's something our telescopes are picking up. It's something that we use many different kinds of telescopes to see and it's something that's inspired me ever since I got into the field of astronomy. Uh, so I thought this would be a good inspirational picture to start with. There's our Hubble Space Telescope. 
Um, it's operating very well even as we speak. I trust our project uh, manager, Pat Krauss, is in the back there. Is the, t is the telescope working right now even as we speak? <laughs> okay, so when you let the bill. <laughs> so um, this is due to so many people working here at Goddard and at the Space Telescope Science Institute and at other places that have worked throughout the years to keep this telescope in tip-top shape and so it's a privilege of mine to be able to work with it and of course as many of you know we have many observatories that we have developed here at Goddard there's space-based telescopes uh, that are looking out and some are looking down on the earth and they all are working together or in, in complementary fashions to, to teach us much about the universe we live in so I just play one, one small role in um, this enterprise of this mission and of course of all the missions that we manage here at Goddard. Um, that's me with a model of Hubble, but I didn't grow up doing this, all right? I grew up um, doing this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is our family farm in northern Arkansas. Uh, in the winter, it's very cold in January, so I'm bundled up there. Um, we raise cattle. Uh, um, that's me in the middle there, um, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Anyway, I didn't know any scientists, all right? I mean, we didn't live anywhere near a city that even had a university. I was three hours away from any city that had a university. Uh, none of my parents weren't able to go to college. Um, they were very uh, keen on making sure that their children did, so we, we were able to go. Um, so it wasn't because I was surrounded by scientists and science museums and that, that I w went into science. It's because, I think, uh, several reasons. One is that I grew up in, surrounded by nature, so I was very inspired by the natural world. You know, I, I could wander around uh, the valleys and streams and, and forests and really just uh, um, soak in the beauty of nature, whether that's trees or, or animals, um, wildlife or, or um, meadows, and of course the night sky. Um, where we lived, the night sky was dark and we could go for walks at night and actually see stars. Imagine that, uh, from horizon to horizon. And I think that played a large part in my love of nature, so it's quite natural to uh, be interested in science because science is, after all, the study of how nature works. And so I would say, uh, I'm going to give little tidbits that I have learned along the way, so maybe some of them will be useful take-homes for you. Um, that one thing that I've learned or experienced is that a little encouragement goes a long way. So um, no one told me, really, you must go into science or some STEM field. We didn't even have that acronym when I was growing up. But what I was encouraged to do was anything that I wanted to do. So, so my teachers, my family, um, thank you very much, were, were positive and encouraging for us to try anything and, and to give us confidence. And so that we could do anything if, if we wanted to. And, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and that came from you know, many directions. It wasn't pressure, it was an openness. It was saying, you know, you can do whatever you're interested in if you just, you know, do your best, do it well. We'll encourage you. We will, you know. Um, and so I'm grateful to community, to my family, church, civic groups. All these, all these inputs to my life were helpful. I guess I have to show you the embarrassing childhood pictures uh, for the maniac talk, but, uh, but there's some aspects of, of my life uh, throughout the years. We won't dwell on this. Um, uh, that's some of my family in the, in the lower left there, my parents, one of my brothers. I have two older siblings as well, and I'm grateful for, for all that they did, um, especially my parents, to sacrifice so that their kids could have the college education they didn't get. And because of the support, I ended up being able to uh, be a class uh, leader. Here's the, the little clipping from the newspaper. And one of the speakers at our high school graduation was Governor Bill Clinton. Anybody heard of Governor Bill Clinton? So um, 
Now, they didn't even bother to put his picture in the newspaper with the other speakers, but, uh, but it wasn't uncommon at that time for our state uh, governors to come to high school graduations, and I think that made us feel, feel um, uh, valued as well. So, take home point. We all can give encouragement to others, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that we all have all the experience of every particular life path. We can't, right? But you can make somebody feel that they have potential and that you will support them and you trust them and that they're worth spending time with, even just listening to, listening to their ideas, you know, taking the time to invest in someone else's life, even if it's only listening. Um, that can go a long way. That's a great encouragement. So as we work with people in our neighborhood, in our families, interns who come here, and so forth and so on, I think these are things to remember in time. Um, spending time with someone and listening to them is probably the most important thing. All right. Next little lesson that I have learned is that um, when you do try new things, be it going to a distant university or a, a new kind of job or a new kind of activity, um, uh, you might be surprised. I've been certainly surprised um, throughout my life at, at things that have happened simply because I had put myself or, or, or the doors had been opened for me to go to a different situation or a different place and um, with a little curiosity on my part to kind of walk through that door, uh, some surprising opportunities or, or things have taken place. So, you know, number one surprise was that me coming from little, little, little out of the way place in Arkansas was able to go to MIT and study physics. So again, I'm grateful to MIT and I'm grateful to my family for enabling me to do such a thing. Um, while I was there, I was able to do something that's more common now, but it wasn't, it was kind of a new idea then, which is for undergraduates to get involved in research. And <clears throat> I'm very grateful that um, in two different labs, um, three actually at MIT over, over my years there, I was welcomed in by professors to learn something or do an internship. And I did two summer internships at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now it isn't that those things I was doing these, these uh, undergraduate research projects and became my lifelong career. That's, that I learned is really not so important exactly what it is you do. It's having an experience, working with professionals. And as I look back, I'm very grateful to the um, the leaders who took time out of their busy schedules to enable undergraduates to come in and work with them. So I worked uh, two, two years in a human spaceflight laboratory at MIT. At that time it was called the Man Vehicle Laboratory. I think they've changed the name now to human something or other. But anyway, it was the idea of, of understanding how humans respond to spaceflight environments. So that was very cool. I was an undergraduate. I got to work, you know, with astronauts or with data that came from astronauts that had been on the space shuttle or, or you know, and test their vestibular and their visual responses before, during, and after space flight. That was very, very cool. Um, I got to uh, work with a professor who studied the Voyager data uh, from the probe well, going around Uranus, studying the rings of Uranus. Um, I got to work... Um, also with a Professor Jim Elliott <clears throat> in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department who took us all out, took students every year out to Lowell Observatory in Arizona to learn what astronomers actually do. Now this took time out of his schedule. I think Vanessa back here has done that trip, yes? Anybody else done that trip with Jim Elliott? Yeah, he's just a wonderful um, professor, uh, n now, uh, now has uh, departed us, but we are very grateful to him for taking time again to trudge out to Arizona with a bunch of unruly undergraduate students and plunk us down for two weeks, even take us hiking in the Grand Canyon, but let us, you know, work as like little apprentices with astronomers at Lowell to see what astronomers actually do. So remember, I'm getting to this lesson, try new things and you might be surprised. So um, as I was out there learning 
some rudimentary things of what astronomers actually do, um, I was put to work <coughs> on something called a blink comparator. Has anybody ever heard of a blink comparator? No. Well, um, this was uh, the way the ancients did astronomy. Um, these are glass plates, all right? So the way we would take pictures of the sky through the telescope back then was with these glass plates. And this was just at the cusp. This is in the 1980s when they're starting to transition over to more uh, computerized uh, uh, types of work and, and uh, CCD type detectors, but you know weren't quite there yet. So my task was to study these two images of exactly the same place in the sky, and if you look closely, you'll see it's the same kind of distribution of stars there. <coughs> and you use a machine that you view these things. And it's kind of scanned, strip at a time, very tediously down the plate, and jumps back and forth between the view of the one on the left and the view and the one on the right. And so most of the time you shouldn't be able to tell any difference, because everything is in exactly the same place as you scan down the image row by row by row. But if something has moved in the short amount of time between those two exposures, so one of these exposures was taken a few hours after the other one, then if something has moved in the you know, near field, such as in our solar system, um, it will jump relative to the background stars as you scan using this blink comparator. And so I was supposed to find a field of asteroids in these plates. That was my task by the, the scientist Ted Bull who was there, who was gracious enough to take me on. And I scanned and scanned and I didn't find any asteroids. But I did find this funny looking thing, which, which you can't see in this image, but it, it was like a streaking thing. It looked like a comet. So I went and asked him, you know, what is this? And I'm sure he said, you know, oh my gosh, I've got to deal with this undergraduate for weeks. Um, but uh, we looked at it and it turned out to, to be perhaps something real. We went back and uh, looked at it with the telescope again, see if we could find it again. It turned out to be an actual object. We, we conferred with the Minor Planet Center up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They confirmed that it was a, a previously undetected object, and I didn't have anything to do with naming it, but they named it Comet Wiseman Skiff. Brian Skiff is the astronomer who actually taken the photographic plates and, and gone back and done some of the follow-up observations with with me teaching me how it's done and so you see it's not a very dramatic comet right the little pointer bars there in the middle uh, show you where it is it doesn't look like a dramatic Halley's Comet um, so that's the, the the bad side of this comet is that it's not very bright and spectacular the good thing is it comes back every six and a half years so so uh, it's a short period comet, and uh, I was able to then observe that comet uh, over the next few months, my senior year as an undergrad, and, and it became the topic of my senior thesis. So that's a surprise, right? So the lesson from this is not go out and try to make fabulous discoveries, I hope we all do, but to put yourself in interesting situations where you're learning new things or you're in an unusual new place, and then sometimes surprises, unexpected things will happen. Now there was something even more unexpected that happened some years later, and this is where, uh, um, I call this my answer to prayer comment, by the way, because I didn't even have a senior thesis at this moment in a topic, <laughs> and you know, quite literally, this was, uh, and my prayers are not always answered so spectacularly, but this was a, a wonderful thing to happen, and then I was able to write this up and, and, uh, and uh, carry it uh, with me, in a sense, for the rest of my life. What I didn't know was uh, a few years later, something else would happen, and um, the Mars rovers, and you're going to think I just made a huge non sequitur, um, the Mars rovers driving around on Mars um, were taking constant images of the sky, right? Um, and they're sending images back. And the Martian sky, just like Earth's sky, occasionally the atmosphere is, uh, is hit with debris. Um, and so you can have meteors on Mars, just as you have meteors in the sky around Earth, as debris, rocky debris, hits the atmosphere and burns up. Well, one of these images from the Mars rover showed a meteor um, burning up in the Martian sky. And so some, that's cool in itself, right? But, but some astronomers off in Europe looked at that image and uh, traced its trajectory, and they came out with a paper 
in in uh, nature to say that they believe that that first Mars meteor that was discovered, they could trace it back to the tale of Comet Wiseman's skiff. <laughs> Can you believe this? So, um, so uh, that um, that's pretty mind blowing. So now I know God has a sense of humor. You see, so there you go. Um, all right. Next lesson I have learned is that. Um, Astronomy is part of a bigger picture. And first let me just start out by saying different pieces of astronomy are part of a bigger astronomical picture. One of the surprises that I had going into graduate school, um, which I didn't mention here, but after MIT I, I went to graduate school at Harvard University. Um, comet discovery didn't hurt helping me get admitted. Um, but um, I learned that I don't know everything about what I think that I want, right? So I had studied astronomy as an undergrad at MIT uh, a little bit, taking you know, this field trip and a class or two, but I, I didn't know very much. I wasn't like these astrophysics whiz kids today that are you know, already writing published papers their first year of college or something. You know, that wasn't me. So, but the one introductory over, overview class I did take as an undergraduate, I. Uh, learned about different types of astronomy and I decided that if I did go into graduate school in astronomy that I was open to doing any kind of astrophysics. I thought it was all really cool except radio astronomy because in my class radio astronomy was all about Fourier transforms and you know it was it was not the, the pretty pictures and, and I you know I thought I could set that aside, but I'd do anything else, you know, optical astronomy, uh, x-rays, theory, you know, I, I thought it was all very cool and I'd leave the radio astronomy to the engineers. But when I got to graduate school and I started actually trying some different uh, uh, research topics, uh, um, I ended up working with a professor who, guess what, was a radio astronomer and he introduced me to the very large array and to what you can do if you have radio telescopes and I found this to be fascinating. You can actually see into these interstellar clouds, you can see these star forming regions and so um, yes, after a couple of years of graduate school I switched into the field of radio astronomy and that's what I have had did for many years is studying um, star forming regions with radio telescopes. So that was a surprise to me, right? I didn't think that that was something I wanted to do and yet I found out that actually these different parts of astronomy fit together and by doing one kind of astronomy you're not precluding doing other kinds of astronomy. You can actually learn different types of uh, astrophysics and today we know that more than ever is that you really have to have a whole uh, orchestra of scientific instruments of telescopes to be able to do good astronomy. I moved on and did a postdoctoral position at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, um, continuing this theme of radio astronomy and studying star formation. I was based in Charlottesville, Virginia. That was a very interesting position. I had a second postdoctoral position as a Hubble Fellow at Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore. And so I was very grateful to have these positions. I was learning a lot about the universe. I was getting to interact with people doing fascinating research. And yet, deep down inside, I was feeling uneasy. Um, this life that ahead of me that looked like it would be a lifetime of getting ever, ever more narrow in focus of a kind of research topic um, and having to get grants perhaps for the rest of my life uh, was not all that appealing to me and so I thought, you know, oh my goodness, you know, why am I having these feelings? I've had all of this education and experience and yet I'm feeling kind of uh, uneasy about this career path. I'm interested in the bigger picture. I want to know how you know, the science we do fits into the bigger questions people have. So um, I didn't know what to do about that. So I did a lot of soul searching and a lot of uh, 
looking around and I was applying for jobs, faculty positions, which is what people in my position were all doing at that stage of career, but I was also looking for something that might allow me to look a little broader because you see when you study, um, uh, let me see if I can get back to our pretty picture here. When you study beautiful star forming regions like this, you don't actually get much time to glory in the lovely pictures. You're down in the weeds. So what I was actually studying was ammonia, transitions of the ammonia molecule um, buried deeply within dark molecular clouds behind these bright um, nebulae that are, that are lit up by stars that have already formed. And it's fascinating, but of course, as you all know, the more you get into a specific kind of, of research, the more, um, the more detail you get into. So I began to look around for other opportunities and even apply for them. And one of them after, you know, I think I tried a couple of times, but I finally got accepted as something called a Congressional Science Fellow. So I worked I, this was a huge step, right, because um, if you get one of these congressional fellowships or policy fellowships, and, and these are generally offered by the major scientific societies, the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, um, things like that. Mine came through the American Physical Society, and these policy fellowships where you work for the executive branch, and that comes from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or the AAAS. If you get one of these fellowships, they generally last a year or two, and then you're done, right? Then what? Okay, so I had to decide whether to risk taking something like this, not knowing whether I could ever return into the academic career path, um, or, or kind of stay in the more safe lane, which um, wasn't e it's not easy by any means to get a faculty position. We, you know, any of you who have been on that that job market know that that's difficult, but but I did have uh, you know an opening in that path, which would have been kind of the sane path to do. But I was feeling this kind of uneasiness with a, a narrowly focused career. I really wanted to be involved in the big picture, so I turned down the tenure track faculty offer and took the one year, which turned out to be one and a half year Congressional Science Fellowship with nothing clear on the other side. So that was, that was either really stupid or really courageous. Um, but uh, I think it was, it was a, for me, it turned out to be a, a, a wonderful choice because um, I was in, exposed to a very different environment for a, a couple of years where I wasn't doing research I wasn't surrounded by scientists. I was surrounded by people who were not scientists. Um, if uh, any of you are curious in these about these fellowships, you can ask me about them. But uh, you get two or three weeks of, of training through the AAAS before they help you find a placement on Capitol Hill. And you can work in any office of, of, of a member of Congress or the Senate who wants you on their staff, or you can work for a committee. In my case, I ended up working for the Science Committee of the House of Representatives. And in particular, I spent my time on two subcommittees that um, are part of that, were part of that House Science Committee, the Subcommittee on Research um, and the Subcommittee on Space. And they handed me the portfolios uh, to kind of oversee on, on the Research Committee of NSF's Physics and Astronomy Program and of the Subcommittee on Space, the, the portfolio of NASA's Earth and Space Science portfolio. So here I am. I kind of thought I had actually left astronomy forever. I had made my peace with that and left. I was going to do something very different with my life. Whatever that was, I didn't know. And here I am plunked not only right back in the middle of the space astrophysics research enterprise, but now they're actually giving me a glimpse into the whole portfolio of the agencies that oversee our enterprise. So instead of being the the, 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 the graduate student or the postdoc, you know, just kind of looking up to these agencies that hoping they might look with favor upon my grant proposal. And this time, they're actually coming to us, these agency leaders, and, and telling us what they're doing, and, and we're trying to, to have a more oversight role. So this is really fascinating for me. 
and I, I'm so grateful for that experience. This was back at a time when, looking back now, Congress was relatively functional, and um, this committee was very bipartisan, and so it was it was quite a pleasure. I mean, there was a lot of stress as well, but it was a pleasure to be there. Um, and I helped put together congressional hearings and things like that. And because I was able then to meet people who were leaders in the science-related agencies, NASA, NSF, and DOE in particular, I was able to hear about opportunities that I might not have heard about or even known or, or known to look for um, before I had this position. And so an office, a, a, a position opened up at NASA headquarters uh, then that I took in 2003 um, as an oversight astrophysicist and I'm very grateful for that. So my next lesson that I've learned that you already know is that NASA is an awesome place to work and space exploration is, is a, just a world inspiring enterprise. I came to NASA headquarters again with my heritage as a scientist with a few years of postdoctoral research uh, experience and then working on Capitol Hill so I had a, a kind of sense of the national view of science which is a very different perspective than what we have from inside the science enterprise and I became a, a program scientist at NASA headquarters and also something called a discipline scientist so the discipline scientist role is, is overseeing some of the grants programs that headquarters handles in the astrophysics division Program scientist means you're overseeing missions from a from a programmatic perspective at headquarters, and, and I had the privilege of working uh, with the Herschel mission, which is a, a U.S. I mean a, a European-led mission, but the U.S. had a role in that uh, wonderful telescope, space telescope. The SEM mission, which was in kind of a concept conceptual development phase, space interferometry mission. It never actually flew, but it was interesting because I learned all about exoplanets. Sim was one of the things Sim was going to do was study exoplanets astrometrically. And then um, and the other little mission that they put me on as program scientist was something called the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, I learned about Hubble for a few months and then all of a sudden something terrible happened which was we were all getting excited about this servicing mission that was going to happen. I mean I was so excited because I was working on this mission and we knew that the next year probably we were going to have an astronaut servicing mission to Hubble and everyone was all excited about it and a few months into my role as program scientist the administrator of NASA announced that this mission would be canceled there were concerns about safety. And so I found that I had to learn very quickly on um, a new role, which was not just program oversight, but was ambassador, because I was having to be kind of the go-between ambassador between NASA headquarters, which had, this decision was coming, coming out of, and unhappy people here at Goddard Space Flight Center, the Hubble project that had worked for years doing these servicing missions and had already been preparing for this servicing mission for years. The Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore that's, that's contracted by the, um, the Hubble mission to do science operations, uh, they were very unhappy. The public, which was very unhappy. Congress, which was very unhappy. And, uh, and then there's little new me, you know, a few months into the role, to try to help build communications between these various parties and also to the public. Uh, so this was learning by fire, but, uh, but it, it is a lesson also that sometimes our roles are not just what's written on, on paper, but who we are interfacing with the people that we influence and are influenced by. And in this case, am being an ambassador is something that I uh, had to learn very quickly. And through the next few years, we actually worked with the project out here to develop a robotic servicing mission so that maybe we could have done some Hubble servicing with robotics um, at that time. But uh, by the time I left NASA headquarters, the decision had been made by um, the then NASA administrator to restore servicing, a, a servicing mission to Hubble. And so we got back onto uh, the track of, of doing that. So... Um, so that was kind of the highlight of my work at NASA headquarters and seeing how things worked from there. Um, at about the end of that little drama, I had an opportunity to come out here to Goddard. And so I came out here in 2006 to become the chief of one of the astrophysics 
laboratories, the Lab for Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics, and I had learned from my experiences at headquarters much more about exoplanets through the SIM mission and stellar astrophysics through my work with Hubble as well. And that was a, a great experience, a supervisory role, and I still uh, 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 um, thematically affiliated with this laboratory. It's now led by Dr. Patty Boyd. Um, at the end of that period, uh, the position opened up to be the senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope mission. And uh, I am very, very grateful for that. Now, what I haven't listed here is, is during the last part of my years as the chief of the Lab for Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics, that servicing mission finally took place, that last servicing mission for Hubble. And because of my roles with Hubble the years before, I got to be a part of that, and that's probably the highlight of my, my NASA time. So I'm going to show you some images from all of this in, in just a second. Yeah, let me show you. So, so this is this last servicing mission from Hubble. Uh, uh, for Hubble, we did we just celebrated the 10th anniversary of this servicing mission. But uh, this is servicing mission four. Glimpses of the astronauts that had uh, trained for years to do this the removal of an older camera, the installation of a, of a newer camera, the Widefield Camera 3 built here, and um, being a part of that and actually being humbled by seeing how all the engineers, the technicians, the scientists, the, the, uh, the, the program managers had worked for years to prepare for this mission, the trainers for the astronauts, all of that was extremely uh, humbling to me and interesting to me and I was grateful to be a part of it and to be seen as a science spokesperson during that mission and afterward. So now um, we get to enjoy some of the fruits of that mission. Um, uh, the Lagoon Nebula image here uh, released not too long ago. Um, Hubble has been uh, also showing off infrared capabilities over the years so um, this is taking advantage of some of Hubble's infrared capabilities in this glimpse of the Horsehead Nebula, and you can see kind of the ethereal gas and emission there. Um, these incredibly beautiful star-forming regions, as I showed you before, where you often see the juxtaposition of massive stars and the remnant gas that's left behind. Um, because of the uh, high angular resolution of the telescope. We can differentiate star from star even in very dense globular clusters. So this was a, after that Widefield Camera 3 was installed on the last servicing mission we got to uh, do this as a kind of a, a calibration image for the camera but it's so spectacular showing you different kinds of stars in one globular cluster that we actually use it now to uh, show off Hubble and just to give you a little perspective here, let me see if I can get this down here. Um, this is an image from the ground looking toward the center of the galaxy in the Centaurus region. And as we zoom in on one of these objects and transition over to the Hubble image, you start to see much more detail. So Hubble doesn't give us that big field of view, but it gives us much more detail into small regions. And so there you see that globular cluster again. I've learned that different types of telescopes have different types of skills, if you will, or, or niches in the environment. So as you just saw, Hubble gives you a lot of detail, but in a small field of view. If you want to see the bigger field of view, you often need a different kind of telescope. Um, so stay tuned for W first, for example, coming up. Uh, Hubble can see certain wavelengths of light, but we also need um, other kinds of light as well. So uh, visible light can can uh, give us a lot, but we need infrared, infrared light to see behind and within some of these dense gas columns. Um, Hubble is being used to observe things even in our solar system. This is one of my favorite images, a beautiful, beautiful image of Jupiter. We're taking Hubble every year and looking at planets in the outer solar system through the Outer Planet Atmospheres Legacy Project. And so you can see uh, how the atmosphere changes over time. That great red spot, for example, is shrinking over time. But what we're also seeing is, um, is in ultraviolet light, we can see what's going on at the, in the auroras of planets. So here we have 
the visible light image of, of Jupiter on the bottom, uh, or the, of, of the main globe, and Hubble's ultraviolet um, techniques, if I can get that going again, uh, showing you what's happening down at the magnetic pole. Well, this is amazingly important information to have, and it also is enabling us to uh, be complementary to the Juno mission that's actually there at Jupiter, taking in situ measurements of Jupiter's gravitational field, magnetic field, things of that nature, and we can, we can compare the activity measured by probes at Jupiter with what we can see when we look at Jupiter as a whole. And of course we're seeing beautiful things like galaxies. Um, uh, these are some of my favorites. Let me just jump to this one. This is a recent uh, collage of galaxies taken showing off Hubble's ultraviolet capabilities. This is part of something called the Legacy service uh, survey and these galaxies or parts of galaxies are l lit up because the ultraviolet light is showing you where star formation is particularly active and this is the kind of thing that we continue to do with Hubble and finally we know about galaxies colliding um, and my favorite in particular the Hubble ultra deep feel where each one of these objects for the most part are not stars in our own galaxy but our other galaxies that's the glimpse that we can get with Hubble and we can kind of get the sense as we look at these deep images with Hubble that the universe um, is beyond comprehension. This is a, a, a kind of a animation created by doing our best measurements of the distances of the various galaxies in the deep field and what you can see as we're sort of pretending to fly through here is that the galaxies are not all the same. They are, some are spiral, some are uh, spherical, some are irregular. As we go farther, farther out in this image, we're actually seeing the galaxies as they were, of course, when their light began the journey to us. So we're seeing farther back in time, and we're seeing these galaxies at a more primitive stage of their development, an earlier stage. And as you see, they're actually smaller. They're they're not as well formed, uh, they haven't started merging together yet to form bigger galaxies. And also, f as we go billions of light years back in time here, we're seeing fewer of them. It doesn't mean that there are fewer galaxies, it just means that Hubble's not able to see them because they're all redshifted, they're caught up in the expansion of space. And so we're, uh, we're reaching you know, the limits of the red shifting or the infrared reddened light that Hubble can see. So here's kind of a collage as Hubble's instruments have improved over the years or, or, or instruments in general over the last few decades. We've been able to see fainter and fainter galaxies, which translates into seeing um, farther out into the universe, which translates into seeing farther back in time. So the time axis here would go from right to left. It's not a linear scale. But when we get to about this point, the light is so stretched as it passes to our telescope through expanding space that it, it's far into the infrared part of the spectrum. We can't see those earliest galaxies. So the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to see even closer to uh, the beginning of time. But already with Hubble, we're able to see a progression in complexity of galaxies. So if you pull out these galaxies and kind of arrange them by their distances, the ones that are closest to us are, are bigger and, and more well-formed, and the ones that are farther away, which means we're seeing them at the earlier stage in time, are smaller, a little more ratty looking. If you do spectroscopy of the galaxies uh, of themselves, you see that the stars in the earlier galaxies are mostly made of hydrogen, helium, not a whole lot else. That's the same is true in galaxies later in time, but they've also been enriched by elements created by generations of stars that have come and gone. So in later galaxies we see uh, carbon, iron, oxygen, things that we need for planets and, and even to support life. This, by the way, is my favorite discovery of the Hubble Space Telescope. Not something particularly flashy, although Hubble does do that kind of stuff, but be to be able to use Hubble and other telescopes together to understand the progressive history of the universe, to me, is the greatest gift that this telescope has given us. And I'm still very, very excited about this realm of research, as we can actually use Hubble 
in complement with other telescopes to see the universe throughout time. It's a time machine. And we can actually see how the universe has progressed toward being capable of supporting life uh, from a very uh, energetic uh, beginning. And I, I just find that fascinating. Um, here's another Hubble image of um, lensing. So finally, I want to, um, to mention a lesson that I have learned that Hubble that science, Hubble and science in general, touches broader questions, values, and interests of humanity. I believe that public engagement is a very, very important part of our work. Um, either as individuals, some of us are able to be involved in that, and at least, and also as an enterprise. And also just being involved, being good citizens in our field. So I have had the privilege of being involved in some science advocacy societies uh, for the American Astronomical Society. I've been an active member for my entire career. Um, I was able to serve as an elected counselor for, for the AAS for some years, and that's where you really learn, you know, what do they say, how the sausage is made, you know, how, how, does, how does an organization function? Well, if you're on the a board or a council of, of an organization, that's when you when you learn that. Um, Hubble affords me the, the ability to talk to many public audiences about what we're discovering and um, why it matters. And I have learned also through working in public engagement with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS. AAAS publishes the journal Science. Um, I work with their public engagement programs as well. In particular, I direct something called the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion where scientists, ethicists, and religious communities actually talk about the big questions. Some of them are astronomically related. You know, what will it mean to the planet if and when we find life elsewhere? You know, that's very exciting, but will it change our whole view of who we are as human beings? What about artificial intelligence? Um, you know, what are the, 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 the good things and the challenges that come with AI? Um, what about... Uh, gene mapping and gene editing. Is that a wonderful thing if we can edit out diseases in our genetic code or is it a terribly scary thing if we can actually change the human genome and that's inherited down the line? The big ethical issues. Um, what about neuroscience? You know, are we only our brains? Um, uh, does our behavior, do we have freedom of choice actually or, or are we uh, basically prescribed to do what we're going to do based on our brain chemistry? Uh, what about environmental stewardship? So, so there's lots of big questions, right, that at the interface of science and the broader issues of humanity, the broader questions we have as human beings, how we should live, how we should use that science. And I think those of us who are involved in the science enterprise um, do a service to, to the world if we keep in mind that what we do is very exciting, but it's one part of a much bigger a uh, much bigger uh, a sphere of interest of the public around us and of our individual lives. So I think with that I will close but leave some minutes here for conversation um, and I'm very excited about um, Hubble's mission. We're in the prime of it. We're going to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Hubble mission next year and yet we still feel like we're a brand new mission because all of these servicing missions have basically created a new telescope almost every time and right now, Hubble is in, in very good shape, and we have a wonderful team that's, uh, that has plans to keep Hubble bringing good science for quite a few years to come. And in fact, we're hoping to overlap in time with this wonderful machine, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I hope some of you got to see Webb when it was here in the clean room. And uh, we're hoping these two telescopes will be complementary, um, operating at the same time for some years, giving us this full wavelength range from the ultraviolet all the way uh, deep into the infrared. So with that, I'd love to have some conversation. Thank you. This is a very basic curiosity. Are your parents still living? They are not. Unfortunately, my father passed away when I was, uh, you know, in the midst of trials and travails in my graduate school year. So I don't, you know, he didn't get to see me actually come out from complaining about how hard graduate school was. But, <laughs> but, uh, but my mother actually has accompanied me on some, some trips to astronomy conferences, so she got to see some of that, and I'm grateful for that. I bet you very proud. I hope so.
she was always wondering if I was going to be dressed okay. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. In your role as a kind of ambassador with the public engagement side, do you find that advocating for these space telescope missions that the pictures speak for themselves, or are there other kind of reasons or things you've learned about how to communicate um, why these missions are important? Astronomy and, and all the space sciences and earth sciences that we do here uh, give us the gift of already intrinsically being very interesting to people. So, so you, you know, you draw an audience just by the, the subject matter, but then that becomes an entree into discussions of, of other things. So, so many people are very curious about space and where we fit into the universe and they want to know what we're discovering, curious. Um, but then that leads into conversations of why should, why should the public support basic research, science exploration, when we have so many problems, you know, acute problems on the planet that need to be solved, why should some resources go into basic research and exploration while we still have unsolved uh, um, you know, acute problems on the planet or, or education. Why is learning about, you know, why is taking an astronomy class relevant to actually learning basic science and mathematics skills that can be used in many different ways? Um, or how do these fields fit together? I mean, we're now understanding that um, even within astronomy, that astronomy is no longer a totally separate field from planetary science and biology and chemistry as we're starting to understand the, the atmospheres of exoplanets, or want to understand exoplanets. So interdisciplinary work is becoming very much a stronger field. And then carry that one step broader, um, I think we're now understanding that advances in one type of science and technology can actually feed advances in other types of science and technology. So. For example, imaging technology used with the Hubble Space Telescope is, is now also being used for medical imaging, things like that. So um, I, I think um, starting with talking about the, the cool things we're discovering uh, with the missions we do here at Goddard and at NASA is, is an entrance to talking about the bigger picture. Why is science valuable and um, how do these different types of sciences uh, feed one another? What do you think is the best medium to engage the public with? What is the best medium? Um, I, I think, um, for one thing, you, you need to talk to somebody that's about two decades younger than I am because I do think there's a generational difference. So, so, so I think younger sphere is very interested in video, uh, social media, things on, on you know, quick uh, quick, short um, internet experiences are, are, are valuable. Podcasts are going over well these days. Uh, for the more traditional, uh, you know, older audiences, um, I actually think the written article with lots of pictures is still a valuable thing. So um, I'm, I'm not quite you need to talk. We have a wonderful group of folks over in the, in the Astro Division. They're called Astrocoms, Astro Communication Experts in the and they could answer that question much better than I, and I'm sure the different directorates across the center are, are much more skilled at this than I. What surprises me as I go out and give lots of talks on the Hubble Space Telescope is that I often carry these little lithographs, printed pictures from the Hubble. And these pictures are all available online, you know, much quicker. Anybody can go to the Hubble website and pull down these glorious images in any resolution you want, and yet everybody wants these handouts, you know, they, they, they fight over them, you know, and, and so there still is something about in-person conversations and physical handouts that people still like, and, and so, you know, I, I don't know the reason for that, I just know that that's something that I, that I experience even today. I also want to say something to some of you folks who listen to this talk, as I've listened to other people's talks about their careers and all the highlights of their careers and you've got to realize that every one of us doing this just like on our CV we pick out the high points and we talk about those wonderful high points and we don't talk about the years of low points between the high points right so so you know careers are not just uh, wonderful like highlight to highlight to highlight most of the time it's been my experience most of our work 
is slow, uninspiring, discouraging. Uh, we often, many people will, you know, if, if you get to know them, will admit that they don't know if they're in the right field. Uh, they feel they don't really see a vision ahead for their careers. They feel maybe, uh, some people feel like they're an imposter in the field or that, they, you know, they're just uh, not not quite as good as these other folks or they don't belong or, or they're just uh, 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 dis or, or totally overwhelmed by all the red tape of, especially when you work in a, in a government agency. So, so you know, I, I would say that par for the course most of the time has been my experience is is not thrills of, you know, contemplating the glories of the universe, but is feelings of being, you know, perhaps overwhelmed, behind on everything, uh, can't keep up with the email, can't keep up with software, uh, trying to figure out where the funding's coming from, trying to deal with personnel issues, trying to, uh, you know, feeling discouraged. All these kinds of things are normal. So, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, want, you know, I'm sure all of you feel wonderful all the time about your careers, but, <laughs> but um, I just want to have a little dose of realism here, and I think hopefully that's helpful to you too. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So, what is the most challenging um, experience that I've had talking about science when I talk to these other public groups, um, uh, public groups, religious groups, other types of groups? Um, Interestingly, I, I, f I have found that if you start, don't start with the controversial questions or issues, start with beauty and wonder and awe and everybody, wherever they're coming, you know, whatever their background or perspective is, everybody is, is on board with that and that brings us a sense of unity, a sense of being fellow citizens on planet Earth in, in humble awe. And then take the next steps into some of these more interesting questions that I mentioned to you, uh, examples of. Um, science doesn't have to be controversy. It seems like people are always thinking that science has to be like on, on one side and other types of ways of thinking about values and life has to be on another and it has to be in some kind of a, a war. Well, I have dis, you know, discovered that that's not only not true for most of history, but it's not actually a helpful framing for talking about things. So I think the most challenging thing that I've found as I talk within different spheres of the public and the scientific community is that often they are not interacting with each other. So they have a perspective about other groups that is often negative or, or makes presumptions and um, and that's something that I have found is, is, is harmful to public discourse and to try to uh, not only sort of talk about my experiences with these different groups of people but bring them together to meet each other and then you find out that there's wonderful common ground so so I think the um, what do they call it today the the uh, the stove piping or the, um, the the bubble effect in our society where people we stay in our comfort zones with people that that think the way we do or, or um, and then we talk to each other about those other people in the other bubbles without actually talking to the people in the other bubbles. Um, that's very harmful. Um, so I would actually kind of rephrase your question as in, in that the most helpful thing I have found is to bring people who are from different ethical perspectives, different religious perspectives, different scientific fields to, together and, and build the architecture to do that. Maybe have a discussion about exoplanets or about space exploration or about uh, about uh, evolutionary biology, whatever it is, and uh, talk about the neat science and then have people from different perspectives talk to each other about why this is interesting to them from their point of view. And it makes for a very interesting conversation. So, um, so I don't know if that's answering your question, but uh, but I just, I find What's most discouraging to me is 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 people uh, not knowing people outside of their their particular perspective or, or kind of bubble, if you will, if you will, and not knowing how to make those connections. And so, um, and we're all multi-connected, right? We are scientists, or we're engineers, or we're we're technical people here at Goddard. But some of us in the room are parents, and we 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 have kids in school. Some of us are have hobbies. 
some of us have pets, some of us are involved in you know, a particular political sphere, some of us are involved in a particular religious faith, some of us, right, we all have multi facets of our lives and I find that each of us can kind of be an ambassador kind of bringing people from these different facets of our lives together to talk about the implications of science and technology and that that helps everyone instead of just talking within our own little bubbles in each one of these spheres and and uh, talking about the other people so uh, that's something we can all do one more time thank you all right thank you very much